Everyone, it's exactly 8.30. Are you ready to talk about slide design for an hour? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope. Um, my name is Ann Fandry. I am an academic technologist in the College of Liberal Arts. Is anybody else from CLA here? Nice, great. Uh, what other colleges are represented? CSE, CEHD. Does that represent everybody here? Carlson. Carlson. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming uh, right away in the morning. This is a slightly interactive session, and I hope that's not annoying given what time of day it is, but please uh, play along if you don't mind. Um, I uh, love to give this talk and talk about slides because I think it's the thing that we most use and we most take for granted. Uh, so this is called New Techniques for Your Slide Design Toolkit. I hope to walk you through the things that I'm showing on the slides and sort of model what I'm talking about. And I'm also hoping that even if it feels a little bit mundane, that you will walk away with something that you can use right away with no extra special skills. Um, so no fancy animations or, or uh, anything like that. Do you, wh who uses PowerPoint in here? Okay, about most, most of you. Who uses Google Slides? Any keynote people? Who's ambidextrous in those, in those areas? Yeah, good, good for you. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to say that the techniques that I'm going to show you, you can use in either of those platforms. So hopefully uh, you will find something useful. There is a handout, and I'm going to talk about accessibility of handouts in a couple minutes, but I want to give you note, uh, a note about the Z-Link. It's z.umn.edu slash new techniques. And what you'll get is a PDF of these slides plus my speaker notes. So that's what's waiting for you if you go to that link. Uh, just a very short uh, story about myself and my journey uh, talking about visual communication for teaching and learning. I started out in the medical school in 2002 assisting teaching physicians with their slides and they were giving me their slide decks and they were saying please make these pretty. And that was the, the directive there. And I started to think about that. I, I like doing that work, like making sure that all the same font was used and that the bullets were in a, in a straight line, stuff like that. But I started to think about the relationship between what makes something pretty and what makes something effective for uh, a, an audience that is listening to somebody talk and looking at the screen behind the speaker. And I studied that. Um, I studied it for my master's degree. I um, got a master's in learning technologies in CEHD, and I read all the books on slide design as well as uh, as much uh, as much literature as I could find on the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, ha has anybody read any of these books? Slide rules, non designers presentation book, presentations in. Any of these books look familiar to you? Great, we're all a blank slate, except we're all doing slide uh, slide design. In any case, I finished my master's, I rewrote the whole thing and made it into this book called Academic Slide Design, Visual Communication for Teaching and Learning. And you can get it for free uh, from this website, www.academicslidedesign.org. I hope you will go there and download it if you think it will be useful for you. I've tried to make the next hour sort of a condensed version of that. So hopefully you get one stop shopping here. <laughs> My, uh, the sort of the main revelation I had when I was doing all that work was the idea that design is iterative and we will start with a design, workshop it for audiences like this, and then have to refine it and tweak it for um, efficacy. And so these slides, I, have, I tweak them literally after every version of this talk that I give, and I hope that you uh, sort of feel oriented to do the same with your slide decks to make, to make sure that they're absolutely the most effective they can be. This is a visual agenda slide. This is what we'll talk about for the next few minutes. You already endured the section where we talk about me. Uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the problem with traditional slide design, which I think all of us know intuitively what, what the problem is there. And then I've uh, form uh, formed the rest of the talk around five common design missteps that I've seen over the last 15 years that I do consultations with people who are preparing lectures and conference presentations. Who is uh, currently preparing a conference talk. Anybody? Is it conference season? You are? December. December? Great. But you got started. Good for you. Um, who is preparing slides for your teaching? Any other scenarios that people have on their minds? Yeah, great. 
In any case, this is a visual agenda slide, and I, I, I show it both to sort of orient you to where we're going for the next few minutes, and also to show you an example of how audiences can assign meaning to anything that they see on our slides. So one of the main ideas uh, that I hope you'll take away from this talk is to put on the slide only the things that you want your audiences to assign meaning to. For example, I spent a very short amount of time with my um, introduction and a little bit longer time I'll talk about uh, the problem with traditional slide design. So we're um, using the length of the, the or the width of the shapes to sort of assign additional meaning. And so all those sort of uh, little subtle things that we put into our slides can make a difference, um, especially if uh, you are talking about a topic that really relies on your slides in a sort of a visual spatial way. I hope that you'll feel free to interrupt me and shout out your questions or raise your hand. Okay. And uh, also, if um, anything about the way I'm presenting is not meeting your needs, please let me know. I'm going to start with the problem with traditional slide design and uh, what is that? What is the problem with traditional slide design? That we all see over and over every time we look at somebody's slide deck. Too many words. Too many words, right? Crowded slides. Thank you. Um, I don't blame anybody for that because this use is sort of built into the software. We see the template slide. Does this template slide look familiar to you? It's kind of what we all see when we open uh, PowerPoint or Google Slides. It suggests a sentence at the top or a couple of words at the top and then some bullet points. And we get outliney <laughs> presentations as a result of that. Do you agree? We get slides that look like this. This is a slide purposely made to look a little bit uh, text heavy. Word um, it's about Bitcoin. Sometimes we put a little bling at the top of it to jazz it up. Has anyone ever done that? I have, yes. So if you know that too many words on a slide is bad, probably you try to correct that by removing some of the text. And perhaps if you've read books uh, such as Gar Reynolds' Presentation Zen, that's one of the, the uh, most popular books on this topic, you try to make it nice and graphical. This is an example of taking part of the content of the previous slide and making it into something a bit more aesthetic. I've got a uh, grayscale picture zoomed in on a chain from a like a chain link swing. And I have written Bitcoin transactions are recorded in a public ledger known as a blockchain. Do you agree with me that this is more aesthetically pleasing than the previous one we looked at? Yes. Does anyone have a problem with this visual presentation? Isn't this fun? 8.30 in the morning? I have a problem with it. Yeah. So how do you decide which of the bullets from the slide before this one was so important that it deserved like, to be highlighted? I'm glad that you asked this question. The question was, uh, how do we decide what things are the main points? That's like 50% of the talk coming up. So I hope that you, I'm going to check in with you at the end of this and see if you feel that you feel you have more clarity there. Thank you. Does anybody have a problem with the, I'm, I'm going to ask a leading question. Good morning. Um, Oh sure, you're 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 sort of bothered by the the lack of balance there. Yeah, yeah. Is it something to do with the fact that that chain has nothing to do with whatever the block chain is? I don't know what that is. Yeah, that's what that's what my problem with this slide design is. Uh, I I wonder if others were bothered by the fact that we've got one kind of chain. And we have another, we're talking about blockchain, which looks nothing like this. Because if people are looking at a chain, this is not going to help them remember what a blockchain is if that was the goal of the slide. So I want to offer you an additional makeover. I'm doing a couple of these makeovers in a sequence. And I'll always tell you when I get to the end of, um, and to show you, showing you my positive example. <laughs> so. This is what I am presenting as the positive example in this sequence. And I have written at the top, Bitcoin transactions are recorded in a public ledger known as a blockchain. 
And then I have uh, placed the, the schematic drawing that uh, you can find in Wikipedia that explains what blockchain is. And this, I would argue, is less sort of beautiful to look at than the, the designy one, but I think it's more effective as a teaching and learning material because it will, it has more chance of having people understand what blockchain is than the aesthetic example. So my larger point with this sequence is that beautiful isn't always better, but that there are little things that we can do to make them more effective. Incidentally, this design is called the assertion evidence method, and it has been studied by um, some people at Penn State. Uh, there's 13 articles that you can find on, on the efficacy of this structure for doing your slides. And I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but be, be on the lookout for this where you have an assertion at the top and the rest of the slide body is spent proving the assertion. So that's why it's called assertion evidence method. But again, I'll talk about that later. All of the things that, that I'm talking about here are based on the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which was first described in the early 2000s by Richard Mayer, who works at University of uh, California, Santa Barbara, and has been studied by hundreds of people since then, uh, talking about how we select information from, a dis uh, from an information display and organize it and integrate it into our understanding. So we are going to talk about that. I'm also showing you this as a, an example of how, if you have kind of a complex visual display, how you can break it down into pieces and walk people through it using just the appear animation that is available in PowerPoint or Google Slides. So hopefully this is an example of that for you. So I have grouped each of the elements of these next couple of slides, and I am doing the um, technique called conceal and reveal. So concealing pieces of the drawing until I'm ready to talk about them. This is all talking about what happens in our working <laughs> memory, and it's all based on three theories um, in uh, cognitive science. Dual coding, the idea that we take in information, separate, separate streams of information through our ears and our eyes. Active processing is the second one, the idea that we are not going to remember anything, that we don't do something active in our brains to try and encode it and remember it. And then limited capacity, which is the idea that we'll, we um, have a limited amount of processing we can do in our working memory. And of course, long-term memory being more infinite as the, as the theory goes. So I will walk you through how this diagram is published in the, um, in the journal. And if you're reading about this in a journal article, of course, the uh, information density of a journal article is different than it is in a live presentation, where um, if you're reading an article, you've got it all to yourself. You can look at it. You can study it as much as you want, as opposed to when we are giving a lecture or a talk, we are doing a time-based medium, and we are having to um, support the audience's need to have things go slowly, to go a little bit at a time. So multimedia presentation, words coming out my mouth, pictures on my slides. You are taking them in through your sensory memory, words through your ears and your eyes, pictures through your eyes. From that visual display and the, uh, the audible portion of this presentation, you are selecting sounds to pay attention to and images to pay attention to. You're organizing the words into a verbal model, and you're organizing the images into a pictorial model. You're making a mental representation that combines both of those things. And hopefully, you will bring some of this to your long-term memory through what kind of process? How will, how will you remember what I'm saying? Uh, if you choose to in a couple of days. Them? Sure, processing. yeah, some kind of active processing, yeah. And um, integrating it with uh, stuff you already knew. And so hopefully some of this feels familiar and you can kind of hook it on to what you already know. All of this is to say in sort of a fancy way that we can't physically read and listen at the same time. Some people argue that idea. 
really what we're doing is switching back and forth really quickly between two streams of information. So when we have a text heavy slide like that Bitcoin slide that I showed at the beginning, we're asking audiences basically to either pay attention to the slide or pay attention to what's coming out our mouths and we're forcing them to make a decision. So we can make a more soothing experience for them if we are clear about what we're doing and not try to do everything at once. Because would you agree with me that slides are trying to do teleprompter, handout, visual aids? Yes. And if we're trying to do all those things at the same time, we're doing none of them particularly effectively. I also think people have started to use slides as an archive in case you missed the meeting. Has anybody seen that? Yeah. So same thing, whatever <coughs> number of things you're trying to do, we're, we're not doing any of them well if, um, if we are not uh, using the medium as it was intended. And PowerPoint was only ever meant to be a visual aid behind the speaker. So I hope that what you come away with, uh, if you think about this presentation, uh, next time you sit down to uh, work on your slide decks, is the idea that whatever you put on the slide behind you, you strive for instant comprehension. And I have on this slide, my strive for instant comprehension slide, I have written just this one main idea because I want you to remember it. And I also have a visual code built in for the rest of this talk. This is a uh, yellow star. Some people think it looks a bit like the Macy's bag. Um, and I hope that when you see it, you think of instant comprehension and you also uh, see it as delineating the positive examples. So we'll go on from there. But I ask you to think about what it means to powerfully point and Think about the net effect of having a whole bunch of slides that have bullet points on them, slide after slide after slide. And the idea that if you are pointing at everything, you're essentially pointing at nothing. So what can you do instead? I think one of the reasons that people make uh, text-heavy slides is the, uh, the suggestion from the software, which we already talked about, and also just the idea that we don't know what to do instead. So I offer you anatomy of a slide deck, the idea of at having bookend slides uh, to help people know uh, the beginning and the end, some image heavy slides in various combinations, the ever useful <laughs> quotation slide, who, who puts those into their decks? Yeah. The main idea type of slide, the idea that anything that you really, really want people to remember, you would put on a slide written out for them because people remember better what they see and hear. Section heading slides to help people stay located within the course of your long talk. And then I'm not anti-bullet points um, at all by any means because I think sometimes it is the most efficient visual uh, design, but I think that um, they should be used sparingly and only for uh, specific purposes, which are when you have a list of things that you want people to remember. And I also want us to consider the <coughs> ecology of all the instructional materials in our courses and the idea that lectures, the point of them is for students to get our expert thinking and the expert way that we have learned over the course of our study to organize information. And that the information density, I think I said this a little bit earlier, is um, perhaps best relegated to assigning readings or other things where students can uh, study things more, more closely and carefully. So just thinking about lectures and putting them in their proper place uh, amongst all the instructional um, materials that we create and all the pedagogies that we use in our classrooms. I am going to give you what I think is a useful visual heuristic for making a decision about what should be on a slide and what you could perhaps just deliver verbally out your mouth. And I am, after I'm done showing it to you, I'm gonna ask you a couple questions about this design itself. So it's, this is three questions that you can ask yourself to decide if something should be on a slide or if you can just say it. One, does it clarify a significant concept in your talk? If not, does it help them remember? If not, does it have some sort of affective function like sustaining interest? For example, you've just finished a heavy, uh, complex 
part of your talk and you want to put up a New Yorker cartoon? Has anybody ever done that to sort of give people a mental break? Something like that? Yeah. If not, if the answer to all these three questions is no, then perhaps you could stop and consider whether you are putting it on the slide just for yourself as a teleprompter to remind you what you had meant to say there. And maybe not, uh, not put, put that on the slide. If the answer to any of those questions is yes, congratulations, your slide is probably contributing to clarity, interest, or retention of your presentation, and you could go ahead and um, put that slide together. So this, I think, is the most complex slide I have in this deck. It's got a stop sign. It took me a minute to find that shape on the, on the slide uh, maker. And it's got some kind of uh, complex arrangements of uh, shapes and lines. So it took me a minute. But I want to offer you uh, a second design and see what you think of it in terms of remembering those three questions as a heuristic. So this is the same slide with, with a different design. Do you need a slide? Does it clarify a concept? Will it help them remember? Does it sustain interest? And I also have added a little bit of typographical salience to some of these words, uh, the, the sort of the main words of each of these. I bolded clarify, remember, and sustain interest. And I want to know what you think about this design as compared to the stop sign one. Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah? I like the stop sign one better. Oh, you do? Yeah. It, uh, you think it will help you remember? Because I really yeah. like the fact that it showed me my decision tree. Oh, sure. That was important for me yeah. how I think. Sure. Yeah, the visual spatial presentation of it. Yeah. Anybody else have thoughts? I liked the stop sign. I liked the decision process. But I thought that this one, it was easier to immediately follow. Otherwise, I just get lost in the decision tree. Sure. You felt a little bit of visual overwhelm yeah. and wondering where it was going. Any other thoughts on the comparison between these two? There's more things to process in the tree if you get each of these three points plus two tapped out of each of the other plus two other main points. Yeah. It's just a sort of process. Yeah, I, I, I might agree with you, though I'm interested uh, that, the, that that was helpful for you. Well, as we're talking about, if it's, if it's sequential, like in other words, because it's the clarifying decision has to be made before you ask the question, does it help them remember? Does that have to be made? You know, if that's important, then the first slide I think is more helpful for me. But if it's just a matter of remembering these three questions, this is clearer. Sure. More, more instant. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all those comments. I want to offer you one more idea and see what you think of this. This is the same slide without the typographical salience. How do you feel about that? So same stuff, no bold. I'm seeing heads shaking. Why, why are heads shaking? <laughs> yeah. If you highlight the words, you can easily take that away, and it's easy to remember the key words when you go away. I think now there's more, it looks like there's just more words, and you're not quite sure which words you should take away. Sure, yeah. I, I agree that that, that, is the, that is the main utility of doing a little bit of boldface um, to make sure. And what the other one also did, if you need the context of the rest of the question, it's still there. I didn't take it away. Um, but the, but the uh, boldface does help you remember the most important points. What about this last one? This is the last in this se sequence. So now I've said, do you need a slide? Clarify, remember, sustain interest. Does anybody prefer this one over any of the others? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> uh, but I put this in this sequence because I see people doing this kind of thing, removing all the sentence context when they have a list of things that they want to put on a slide. And um, I think people are trying to you know, use fewer words because we know that the main problem we're trying to solve is that there's too many words. But then if we remove too much context, then what we have is just not useful to anybody uh, except for perhaps the slide author. That was the problem with traditional slide design. I'm now going to move on to five common design missteps that I see. I've worked with uh, people across uh, every discipline uh, in the, at the university uh, for, like I say, for 15 years. And uh, these are things that I see uh, everybody doing. I see, I've seen myself do them. I'm not trying to slide shame anybody. Um, 
but what are they? And I'm, I'm going to list these out here because I um, think they are points worth uh, remembering. Uh, so there are five common design missteps. One is inaccessibility. One is too much stuff on the slide, and we've already touched on that a little bit, but we'll uh, talk a little bit more about it. One is no point of entry for the eye, like um, what one of you was saying, like you just didn't know where to look on the visual display. Uh, decoration, that's uh, the most common that I see, and then visual incohesion, uh, where the slides look like they were sort of cobbled together from several different decks, when in fact that happens in real life, doesn't it? Uh, so. This, uh, this, I will just say a thing about this slide design. This is another bullet pointed list. Um, and I'm doing the conceal and reveal, but I am keeping the points, the bullets that I'm not talking about, sort of grayed out so that whole list is still visible to you if that's useful for you, sort of to know where we're going. Um, but I wanted to highlight the inaccessibility because that's the section we're in. So you can do little things like this to help your audiences stay located in, in your talk um, because our organization of our talks is not always necessarily apparent to our audiences. You, and I see he heads nodding, so I know that you agree with me on this. So I've made a uh, fake slide about gavials, <laughs> which I didn't know existed until maybe last year. Uh, it's uh, in the crocodi crocodile family, um, and it is uh, the sort of slide design that we sometimes see where you've got bullet points on the left talking about the gavial and then a picture of the gavial on the right. Uh, the distinguishing feature seems to be this uh, rounded snout that's on the male. It's called the boss. Who knew? Um, I want to talk about accessibility of your slides if you are distributing your slides to your students and just tell you the five things that you would need to do to your slide deck to make it an accessible uh, instructional material. And what I mean by accessibility is that somebody who was using an adaptive technology like a screen reader to read the slides was uh, um, listening to the slides with their ears rather than looking at them with their eyes. So that's the, that's the, um, that's the need that we're addressing with this section. But here are those five things. Using layouts instead of manually created, <coughs> pardon me, using layouts instead of manually created text boxes. And what I mean by layouts, um, hopefully these look familiar to some of you, um, just built-in templates that kind of give you some uh, spatial positioning for the elements of your slides, uh, body and images. Uh, correcting the color contrast, making sure that you have uh, very dark against very light or very light against very dark. Alternative text for any images that you have uh, including text boxes. And that feels counterintuitive because it feels like if we create a manual text box, does everybody know what I mean by that? I'm talking about going up to the toolbar and finding the text box and putting it on your slide and writing in it. Screen readers can't access that information for whatever reason, um, but if you write text in the template in the slide, um, screen readers do know how to get the text out of that alt text for text boxes, alt text for images, as I just said, and then making sure that the order of the elements that are on the slides are presented in a logical way. And most slide programs order things in the order in which you put the elements on the slide. This is a picture of the reorder tool that's available on PowerPoint on Mac. Does anybody know if this is how it looks on the um, PC version of PowerPoint? the order tool. Has anybody explored that before? This is just to say that um, you have to pay attention to how you stack the images and make sure that um, the order that they are in is the order in which you would want somebody with a screen reader to encounter each image. Yeah? Um, I just want to make sure if we use one of the layouts, but then we manipulate the size of the text box, will that affect the reading? Good question. Uh, no, it's only it's only like when you drop the slide when you drop the um, okay. when you drop the uh, text box or image on there. Okay. Yeah, and it's and it reads um, top to bottom on the on the pre-made templates. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay. So you're saying that alternative text for text boxes is important because somebody with the accessibility issue going on what won't read. Yeah, exactly. That's perfect. So this, uh, I, the, the boss knows on this gavial, I made a manual text box from my, um, from my uh, rich text editor, and I needed to also right-click, find the alternative text entry thing, 
and write the word boss a second time in order for a screen reader to okay. encounter that. So we can't see that really. We can't see that exactly. But I can totally show you that if you are interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I'm happy to you know demonstrate any of this if if you'd like. Um, the the scope of this talk is not about um, making accessible slides. I just wanted to point this out to you and then offer you a couple of additional ideas for how you can create ac uh, accessible materials uh, to accompany your lectures. If you want, you can listen to a very soothing presentation by myself about. Uh, accessible slides uh, on accessibility.umn.edu. That's uh, our university's accessible accessibility website resource. Has anybody gone there before? Anybody heard of it? Excellent. The word is out. Yes. So hopefully you all will go take a look because it also has stuff, um, additional stuff about instructional materials, a whole, a whole section dedicated to instructor issues, um, learning management sy system issues. Um, I often see people distributing a handout that is comprised of thumbnails of the slides with uh, a place for notes. Has anybody ever done that? Yeah, me too. And then I learned that anytime I do that, um, the stuff that is in the uh, thumbnails is not accessible by a screen reader unless I put alternative text on each one of those slides. And to me, that is several steps too much for me when I've already gone to all the work of making a slide deck. So I, I would, I'm presenting this as the thing not to do, but I want to give you two ideas for things that you could do to make accessible handouts. One of them is to prepare a slip, separate word version. I have done this uh, for talks when I'm first writing them out. I make a, I make a handout like this from my script. So it's not any extra steps from what I've already done. It's just paring down my script a little bit and making it more digestible with the main points of my talk. So that's a thing you could do. And the thing that I have done for you with that Z-Link that I shared a little bit earlier is to make a PDF with the slides, uh, one per page, with my speaker notes and have my speaker notes written in such a way that it also serves as alternative text. So. It also reinforces uh, an, another accessibility best practice for presentations, which is not showing anything on your slides that you're not also verbally describing. So I've had to get myself sort of into the habit of talking and sh talking about what I'm showing, if that makes sense. So this is another thing you could do to make an accessible handout. Or you could do those things that I showed first um, that that talk about making the slide deck itself accessible. So those are some, some things that you could do. Some other things uh, related to accessible slides are um, choosing a font that is not distracting or difficult to read, especially at the very back of the room. Um, a lot of times we try to get a little bit creative and uh, choose a display font. Display fonts are any fonts that, are, that have a little bit of emotion to them. They, they evoke an emotion by, by looking at them. Uh, this slide reads, display fonts are harder to read. And the reason for that is because the uh, letter forms are irregular. And that's something perhaps we don't think about, but that's why, the, why display fonts are, that's why they evoke an emotion when we look at them. And that's also why they're harder to read, especially in large quantity. Here are some other display fonts. I've got some, a handwritten one. I've gotten one that's uh, all caps, uh, small caps, and then the um, much, uh, mis much aligned uh, comic sans, which none of us would ever put on our slides, right? Yes. Just to show you that Gabiel slide, I, I first showed it to you in Arial font, which is a, a transparent font, um, and now I'm showing it to you with a display font, and you can see that it's harder to, to read, especially in quantity with the, when you get into those bullet points. So here's an idea that you could uh, take away with you for making decisions about fonts, and it is that uh, we're searching for transparent typography, which means you don't even notice it. This slide reads, font choice is successful when you don't notice it. So hopefully you are only noticing my font choices during this part of the uh, presentation. If you don't like thinking about fonts, here are three that are that were designed specifically for screen reading, Trebuchet, Georgia, and Verdana. So any of those would be good choices for you. Um, but like I say, any font that is transparent, that is you don't 
even realize you're looking at it is a good choice for your, for your slides. Um, the old advice here used to be that you wanted to uh, use a sans serif font, which is uh, Trebuchet and Verdana are both sans serif fonts, meaning they don't have serifs on the ends of the letters. The serifs are the, the end caps on the letters on Georgia. Georgia is a serif font. Um, that is uh, older advice um, from back in the days before we had nice crisp displays. So you um, probably don't need to um, use that as your, as your uh, way of making your font decisions anymore. Color contrast, um, there are, we could get real technical about this, um, but very dark against very light or very light against very dark. Either of those is, are good choices. Black and white is the strongest color um, contrast that you can achieve on slides. I've seen people do uh, rainbow color schemes. This slide encourages you to avoid them. Um, and why, why, why should we avoid rainbow color schemes or something like that? What? It's yeah, it's straining to the eyes. Yeah, I agree. And even if I did the rainbow color scheme against a dark background, we're also getting color vibration here, aren't we? With the gray and the yellow, uh, where the colors seem to like react with each other. So you would never do this, but I have seen people do it. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, yeah, because that, that's what uh, looks salient in this display. I agree. Uh, color contrast is both a uh, function of size and of the, the two hues that you're comparing. So here I have written yellow on white on this slide. It's probably fairly easy to make out if you're looking at this slide. How about now? How about when I shrink the text down? What do you think? It's harder. Yeah. And why make, why make these things hard on our audiences? Just choose different color combination. You're always safe with black and white. If you have two uh, hues that you want to put on top of each other, if, and you know the hexadecimal value, which is the computer code for uh, what the exact shade is of the hue, you can go to webaim.org slash resources slash contrast checker and put those two hexadecimal values in and it will tell you if they pass. I will say that our maroon and gold pass um, when you put them one on top of the other. I was proud to see that. Um, but maroon, but the, but the gold doesn't always pass on, on some of those later colored backgrounds. I also see people putting text on top of images. And I think there's plenty of scenarios where that makes sense. Like if you have an image, you want to evoke an emotion that, that has the image and then putting text on top of it. Um, but um, what is the problem with, with that? Yeah, yeah, you especially lose the letters in the darker part of the background because I've got black text here. This actually says add a highlight box behind text to create contrast over images. And I just want to offer you that as a technique that you could use if you have a reason that you want to put text on top of an image. This is one technique you could use to make sure you had consistent contrast and you're just, again, we're striving for instant comprehension and uh, the highlight box behind it can help. You can also, um, <laughs> For those of you with the keenest eyes in the room, you may notice that I also added a little bit of transparency to the highlight box, so I still get the full image, but I also take advantage of the color contrast there. I used to say, and kind of still do say, but I don't think it's a hard and fast rule, the idea that you would stick with a couple of colors that you start with and you make that decision at the beginning of your slide deck and just stick with it. And I will talk a little bit more about why I think that is. What I'm showing you here is the four colors that I used as the color scheme for this deck. And actually most of my decks, it's just easier when I copy slides from one deck to another. But I, I'm showing the RGB values and the hexadecimal values. And I have taken a picture of this. And on this next slide here, I um, put it into a color contrast or a, co a color blindness simulator. That you can, and you can find these, any, just Google Color Blindness Simulator. I, um, what I'm showing you here is the, that 
um, those four colors uh, with um, what they would be seen by somebody who has red-green color blindness. And probably if you have red-green color blindness, you see no difference between the, uh, my before and after example here. This is just to say, I have one more in this sequence, um, and here is what it, those same four colors would look like if somebody um, had, wasn't able to see color at all. Uh, this is a grayscale uh, version of my color scheme. And it's also what people would see if they printed your slides off on a uh, black and white printer. This is all just to say that whatever colors we see when we're designing, we, can't, we don't have any control really over what uh, colors people experience when, when they um, when they look at the when they look at your slides, so making sure that whatever color scheme you choose, that's not the only way that you are expressing the information. That was my inaccessibility section. And I'm going to move on to too much stuff on a slide. We already talked a little bit about this. Here I have a uh, purposely uh, ineffective slide on cognitive theory of multi, uh, multimedia learning, specifically one of the principles that comprise it called the multimedia principle. I can make, I can improve upon this by thinking, what do I most want people to remember? Uh, does it clarify a concept or what's my third question there? Who remembers? Is this fun? What? Yeah, nice. Um, so if I'm thinking, what do I most want to visualize on a slide, because I most want people to remember, I am going to isolate that. And in this uh, makeover example, I have isolated we remember better what we see and hear. So that would be a positive example there. So instant comprehensibility. And then the idea is that I would talk from this slide and have you absorb most of the information about that topic with this as my backdrop. Here's a slide about market meritocracy. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to isolate what could be the main idea, depending what my goal was for my, for my lecture. In this case, I chose upper middle class status is sticky across generations. I put that on its own slide and isolated it with a bunch of white space around it so that you can't help but read that text in the middle of that slide. And I can do one more thing to this. Does anybody else have an idea about what I could do to make this even more instantly comprehensible? Yeah. Move sticky or some uh, part of that more uh, salient by making it like bold or enlarging font maybe? Yeah, I could, I could do some more typographical uh, salient stuff with, with like bold face. Yeah, I absolutely could. Yeah. Going on generation, like going <coughs> stick figures, a little kid, big kid, or sure. something that pulls out from I want to talk about that in the decoration section because I think I think that's an interesting idea, and this that is our impulse that we want to do so badly, and I think I, I'm going to talk about image selection, but but I think I think that that is an impulse that we have absolutely. My thing with this slide is that when I have three lines of text. I'm making you, your eyeballs, go back to the beginning of every line to read this. And I can, so I'm, this is a line to show you what your eyes are doing. I can make it easier for you to read, just instant, uh, by left aligning those lines of text. So hopefully that is something that you can do um, right now with, with your decks. So that's the positive example there. That was too much stuff on a slide. I want to talk just briefly about points of entry. And this is uh, most uh, useful when we have a complex display. Um, the idea being help your audience know where to look first. Um, this is visual hierarchy in a nutshell. Visual hierarchy is uh, something that's talked about in graphic design and art. And the idea is that the big thing gets looked at first or the bright thing and that eyes follow lines. So that's visual hierarchy in a nutshell. In the absence of any other uh, things that you might do to your slide, people are going to read in the Z pattern. People from Western audiences are going to read in the Z pattern because that's what we've been trained to do over a lifetime of reading in books. And I want to know how this plays out for you. This is a agenda slide from uh, 4-H Extension, just a talk that I help somebody with their slide deck. 
what what's salient here for you? What's the first thing you look at? Sure. Anybody look at anything else first? Anything caught your eye? Yeah. The red oh, sure. <laughs> and that's so funny because that's me uh, taking a screenshot and not thinking about the uh, fact that I was getting my spelling corrected by my software. Good eye. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Did you did you go in that order when you looked? I'm not sure. Sure. Yeah, because it happened so fast, and then you made sense of it. I've had people also say that the third thing was the thing that they looked at first. So this is an idea. Uh, this is an example of where you might care a little bit about what people look at first. Here's another example. This is called Retreat of Western Liberalism, and it's four parts of this person's lecture. And kudos to this person who put this lecture, put this slide in their lecture because they wanted their students to know where they were going in the lecture. But what do you look at first in this one? The red, the red or maybe uh, maybe the yellow, either one, depending who you are, individual differences, yeah. So, but the idea is we probably want them to look part one, part two, part three, part four, in that order. Um, I'm So now we're talking about decoration. Um, and this is the thing that I think, this is uh, the easiest thing for, for us to add to our slides and the hardest thing to convince people that perhaps um, we we want to leave off uh, slides, particularly for instructional materials, and that's the idea of superfluous decoration. Um, I see people doing this in uh, clip art sometimes, uh, putting it top right, bottom right, bottom left, anywhere. Um, I don't see that as often as I see people putting corporate stock photos on their slides. This is the four P's of marketing, and this fictitious slide designer thought that picture of people uh, bending over the uh, outdated laptop might, might uh, add some uh, visual interest to this slide. Here's another visual treatment of the four P's of marketing, product, price, promotion, and place, with the definitions in parents behind each one of those. What do you think of the difference between, like if we're looking at, if, if what we want is for students to understand and remember what we're talking about, um, what is the um, what? What do you think of the fact that we've got the the uh, picture, the corporate picture here? Does it do anything for you? Yeah, just distracts. Just distracts. And there's all this um, research under that uh, cognitive theory of multimedia learning uh, under the um, they call it seductive details. And it's just this idea that even if our students are very versed in looking at a picture and understanding it as decoration and having basically nothing to do with uh, the main points, they're still having to spend some of their mental resources on that. So we could just remove that and have them just experience the words. I want to offer five good reasons to use graphics on slides. The reason not to use graphics on slides being to jazz things up or add visual interest, because of course your lectures and conference presentations are all engaging on their own without pictures um, decorating the slides. And those uh, reasons are to show what something looks like, to show where something is, to show a relationship between concepts, to add visual variety and a sort of a mental break, or to evoke emotion. And you may have additional reasons that you would put images on slides. Um, so now I'm, these next five slides are just going to show you an example of each one of those five reasons to show what something looks like. I think if I read you the definition of what a catkin is, uh, which is the one of the sexual st uh, structure of uh, deciduous trees in North America, uh, you might have a harder time picturing uh, what a catkin was. Uh, but if you see a picture of what it is, then you'll uh, more instantly recognize it. To show where something is, this slide shows a screenshot of a website and using uh, an image and some uh, visual indicators to show where parts of the uh, website are. Thinking of how you can use visual spatial positioning to show a relationship between things. This slide is the kingdoms of life, fungi, animalia, plantae, archibacteria, eubacteria, and protista in a bulleted list, but I could get even more information 
by showing those six kingdoms of life with the universal ancestor and where they kind of arc off from each other. So showing a relationship among concepts. And then to show visual variety. As we saw when we were looking at the, um, some of the earlier slides in this deck, um, visual variety is uh, also able to be overdone. So I'm, I'm suggesting not to rely on that as your, own, your only uh, visual tool in your toolkit. And then the last one, uh, to evoke emotion. This is a picture of people uh, celebrating their graduation accomplishment by throwing their mortarboards in the air, and they're so gleeful and happy and proud of themselves. And the slide, in my opinion, sort of ruins it by making that into a little thumbnail and uh, putting it next to, are you ready for what's next? And I want to contrast that with the idea that if you want to evoke emotion on a slide, just go ahead and fill that whole slide canvas with the slide. You know, just let the audience immerse themselves in, in, that, in, in that technique. A great place to use a slide is on a, uh, to use an image is on uh, title slides to help um, whet people's appetites for, for the information that they're about to learn. I want to contrast for you this uh, new health regulations for fast food companies by the fictitious Marsha Goldstein. Contrast it with fried fast food and the law using uh, the sort of McDonald's color scheme and uh, fr some french fries is offering you the idea of which one of these two lectures you'd rather listen to? It's this obvious question. I want to return to this idea of the assertion evidence method um, as a place that people might um, obviously use more images and more visual spatial uh, communication techniques. Um, as I said in the a uh, little bit earlier in the talk, the assertion of evidence method stating the main point at the top of the slide and then using the whole rest of the slide canvas to prove that assertion. If you are a person who gives a lot of data slides already, your slides are already very well uh, aligned to use this method. Um, this is a data slide talking about where it asks the question, where is support most needed? But it, we can make just one, tech, uh, one tweak to this slide and have it um, be an assertion evidence slide by just simply saying what the data is saying. Because we all know that we have different levels of data literacy in our audiences, and we can just help make people's uh, lives easier and help them come, uh, remember what we're saying if we just write on the slide, research support is most needed in preparing and preserving data. And then by just telling them what the data, should, what the data is uh, saying, we are uh, saving them a little bit of work there. So that's a positive example in that sequence. Soil solarization, here's a purposely uh, text-heavy uh, slide that talks about what that is. I can make this easier to understand by, uh, with this makeover, solarization concentrates the sun's energy under plastic to kill pests and pathogens. And I have uh, selected a photograph that shows the plastic uh, and shows uh, the, the, um, what solarization actually looks like in practice. So those are a couple examples of the assertion evidence method. And like I say, this is a well-researched uh, method, um, testing recall and retention up to a week later. And also, uh, one of the studies showed that when we, as the subject matter experts, prepare our slides in this way, it also helps us learn our material better. So I, I hope that you are convinced to try this out in some of your, in your deck. I had also uh, wanted to just talk briefly about visual cohesion. And I think, this is great. We're even going to have time for a couple questions if, if you have some. Um, but visual uh, cohesion, um, making sure our slides look like they're all part of the same package, that can help us uh, with our professional credibility. And even more than that, it can also help our students learn the codes by which we communicate information. So we're making things more instantly comprehensible because we're only having students learn one way in which we communicate information visually. Consistent slides makes for a con cohesive deck. And like I say, we all have taken slides from a bunch of different talks and put them into the same uh, talk before, so that happens. But I want to convince you just to go back over them and um, do a couple things to make them look like a unified whole. 
And also, if you are doing a collaborative presentation, anybody do any of those monsters lately? Uh, where you've got four different slide authors, um, electing a captain to go through and do a visual, uh, visual unity thing can, can go a long way uh, for a group presentation. So my style guide for this deck, I already showed you the color scheme, uh, the color system, and how I, not, not only what hues I'm, I used, but also identified, I also identified the main purpose that I had for each of the colors. I used the mostly uh, white for background, mostly dark for text, the pop color was mostly the uh, gold, and then my emphasis color was maroon. And I switched it up a little bit, but that's, I called it, I call it a, a color system, not just a color palette, because I made some of those decisions, not just about what the hue was, but also how I was going to use it. Uh, I also had, um, I realized with this slide deck, I had been using gray as well, so I added that in there. I made some decisions about typefaces, using Fahala 1 for my headings and Corbell for my body text. Some, those are the obvious ones, uh, font and color, but then I also did a couple more subtle things, just little decisions that I made for myself before I started this deck. Um, one was uh, the shape of the pointers. I could also have used all pointy pointers, like arrows, um, but I, I happen to like rounded uh, pointers, so I used those. And you may, may have noticed that all my appear animations I did fast and I had hard angled shapes uh, for all my shapes. I could as easily have used uh, rounded shapes, maybe with a, an outline, just the idea being you'd be con consistent with whatever you chose to do. Um, and I could also have done uh, more gradual appears, but I just wanted to make those decisions so that all of it looked the same. And all of these things kind of contribute to a, a visually cohesive deck. I said to myself, I'm going to make section headings all look like the agenda slides, so kind of a anchor from what we said we'd do in the beginning. I put resources, any of those URLs that I shared with you, I put on a yellow slide with black text. My main point slides, I put black text on white. I didn't do this very much. I did a little bit in the beginning, but um, if you have citations, it's nice to put them somewhere that's less ob uh, visually obtrusive, so they're there if people want them and uh, kind of blend into the background if people aren't interested in them. And then choosing a consistent spot for media credits. I also <clears throat> sometimes put my media credits on a slide at the end or as part of my handout. In this slide, I'm putting my media credit on the side if I had put it on the bottom, people might think it was a caption just because we're sort of used to the bottom of an image being where the caption is. And that is all I wanted to say about visual cohesion. And here is the Z-Link for this slide deck. Again, if you uh, didn't grab it the first time, z.umn.edu slash new techniques. And we have three minutes. Does anyone feel like we've been on a long, fun journey together? Anybody thinking anything or have any slide problems they'd like to share with the group? Yeah. What's your technique for when you, you know, you had said, we were talking about accessibility and you said you try to get in the habit of what's on the slide is what you're talking about. Yeah. But a lot of times there's a lot that you want to say. Yeah. And then at times maybe you even want to engage the class. Yeah. Um, sometimes. I'm wondering what, what the best technique would be to go to a blank slide just to get eye contact and start some dialogue, or would yeah. it be, I don't know, I just, your ideas on when you really don't, when you have so much that you're talking about that it's not, you don't want them to keep staring at the... Sure, yeah, because they might be uh, still trying to process what you have yeah. just finished walking them through, stuff like that. Do you know the <laughs> B and the W technique? You can press the B or the W on your keyboard and uh, go either to a black or a white blank screen. I, um, at the very beginning when I wanted you to listen to me talking about my uh, little story about the medical school, I had a blank slide built in there so that you would be looking at me. So stuff like that. I think that's a great idea. Do you do, you do that already in your lectures? Some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime we can focus people's attention back on us one way or the other I think is a good technique. Good question. If some if somebody comes to me with twenty uh, ineffective slides, um, often more, with fewer things on them. Yeah. 
And that's so satisfying and fun to work through somebody's slide deck with them. Yeah. It's probably a terrible question, but what about like the use of time zone element? Is that like a bad font to use? What what do other people think about using Times New Roman? That's a that's a serif font. That's like the basic font that's on everybody's computer. What do other people think? I have an opinion, which is that it's a transparent font because people are used to reading it. I don't I don't like the way um, I don't like the X height related to the height of the capital letters, so I wouldn't use it. But um, you know, you could workshop it with your audience. And, and um, another thing you could do is ask them what device they're usually using to access your slides. If they're just looking, I, you, you won't have a problem with like visual comp, you know, comprehension or readability of the slides, but um, I just personally don't like the look of it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, thank you for spending part of your morning with me. I hope you have a good day at TES. <laughs>